structure is the oldest structure in Central Park. Why? Because it used to be part of the forts back in 1812. It's the only one remaining of the forts that were on the Upper East Side. Blockhouse 1 was built under General Joseph Gardner Smith after a nearby naval battle. On August 9th, 1814, a British war vessel attacked Connecticut. Within days, New York started building trenches, forts, all the like. Luckily, this never saw war, and New York City never saw war. It was later turned into ammunition storage. So imagine, lots and lots of guns inside of here, and bullets and whatnot. Very, very intimidating. Very, very dominating. <laughs> this place doesn't have much of its history shown. There's no plaque or nothing, because shifty people like to hang out here. And for some reason, they keep stealing the plaque. But yeah, that's what this whole stuff is for. And if you play Pokemon Go, it's a gym now. Just walk past a scary rock on the way here with a face on it. Collier Brothers Park. Park named after two brothers, Langley and Homer. This wonderful place here used to be their apartment. They had an acute disposophobia, which we now named after them as Collier Brothers Syndrome. Pretty much they were extreme hoarders. Now, why do they get a park named after them? A syndrome named after them? Even a thing firefighters are afraid of finding? A Collier house after them? Well, back in the 1940s, they inherited this house, house, from their family. And this neighborhood is Harlem, a predominantly black neighborhood, and they were kind of afraid of black people. Racism, man. Eh? But sometimes the uh, neighborhood kids would throw things on their houses, rocks, stuff, annoy them. Not the best thing. And they got paranoid, even more than he already was. Boarded up their windows, saved so many things inside of their house. And then tragedy struck. Langley normally would go outside to get food from trash receptacles and whatnot and bring it back for his brother and that's what they would eat. That's how they survived. He one day didn't come back, or at least we thought. His brother thought he didn't come back and passed away of starvation. No one heard from them for a while and then someone called the police and were wondering where did the brothers go? They found Homer sitting down in a chair, passed away, but they had to get through so much chunk. After they removed the building, it was over a hundred tons of chunk. That's a lot. But they was wondering, where did his brother go? What happened to him? Before they did tore down the house, the building, about a month later, when they came back, they realized that the brother Langley was caught in one of their traps that they had covered in the house in fear of one of the kids breaking in and stealing something. And he was only 100 feet away from his brother and he passed away from starvation because he was paralyzed underneath the trap. But in the end of all of the tragedy, we have something wonderful, a public park, the history of behind your city.
This beautiful little corner here may seem all pretty and sleek, which it really is. The artwork here is very extravagant and beautiful, but it carries a very gruesome history in its past. In the 1930s, the Tong Gang was responsible for many shootings and murders involving hatchets right here in this very neighborhood. That's why it's called Bloody Angle. The police can even say that the Tong Gang was responsible for the most gruesome murders in history right here in this very street. Let's see what other people on the street think about this and what they have to say. So we're here with... Fernando. So, um, did you know about the history of this place here we are? On Joyer Street, I know this was considered one of the most violent streets in the United States of America back in the day. This was ground zero for control of the streets by the different gangs. There was actually a, a famous opera singer. Got into a beef with somebody, escaped an assassination attempt, and then like two or three days later, they found him and they killed him. That's one of the little famous stories, and now it's that famous fancy restaurant on the corner. But back in the day, that was an opera house. And that's where that went down. So, Felix, do you know the history of this place where you are? No, no, no. This is actually called Bloody Angle, and back in 1930s, the gangs here, known as the Tong Gang, were responsible for a lot of murders here, responsible with hatchets. And police say that this very street, this alleyway right here, is the most violent, most gruesome alley in all of New York City. Did you know that? No. Well, I thought it was just like part of the Chinatown, which is non-violent at all. Today is not non-violent, but back well, in I the mean, day... Mm -hmm. Back in the day, it was a very violent time. Mm -hmm. Axes being thrown. Yeah, five points, bloody angle. A lot of different parts of New York City that are like tourist attractions now, but sometimes like very dangerous places. Mm -hmm. Well, other than that, thank you very much for your time. Glad you were able to talk to us. Thank you. Hidden in the city among the rustling trains and the melody of conversation lies an instrument. This is Reach. Okay. It's located here at 34th Street between Harold Square on the N and R tracks. Pretty much these are motion sensors at the end of these tubes, carefully hidden within the landscape of the train station. And if you wave your hand over it, the sensors do the rest. Here we are at Death Avenue, also known as 10th Avenue in New York, between 28th and 29th Street on the west side. Now you're probably wondering, why is it called Death Avenue? Well, back in the ye old days, we had trains running up and down the streets, and New Yorkers being New Yorkers crossed the street. We called cowboys off on the west to ride their horses in front of the trains and warn people of the trains coming. There were still many, many incidents, about 400 or so, till a kid got killed and we were like, all right, enough. So we stopped it and they needed a way to get the freights through the city. So they moved it over to the High Line. Wonder how that beautiful thing got up there now. The dark history behind the High Line. guys, welcome to another YC Weekly. I'm Yvonne and today we're out here on Roosevelt Island visiting the Cat Sanctuary at the Wildlife Freedom Foundation, right behind me. This sanctuary was inspired by a beloved cat named Princess Ying Yang, whose death happened in 2004. Since then, a group formed this local sanctuary for neutered and stray cats. We're here with... Justin. Hey Justin, how are you? Pretty good. Good to hear. And do you know the history behind Roosevelt Island? I do not. I do not. Well, I'm sure you'd be glad to know that there's actually a cat sanctuary nearby us, and it's actually for neutered and stray cats that unknown owners have actually left behind. Oh, I didn't know that. Where, where on the island is it? It's right across the little hill that's in front of us, and you know, we can always take a look with you if you like. Sure, we can go walk over there, I guess. <laughs> 
So we're out here in front of the Cat Sanctuary, and what is your opinion on this? It's kind of cool to have a place like this in the city, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And of course, you know, they have their own little home, and, and that way they're not alone. That They have each other at the moment. So today, we're here with? Uh, Clara. And do you know the story about the Cat Sanctuary down the street? No, I don't. So the cat sanctuary is actually held for neutered or stray cats left by unknown owners. What is your opinion on this? I mean, I guess this island is a good place for them to be since it's kind of empty compared to the city. Yeah, and would you yourself um, adopt a cat one day or do, are you a fan of cats? Yeah, I am. I actually used to have two cats. Now I just have dogs though. Oh hey, didn't see you there. As you can see, we have entered the Whisper Hall here at Grand Central Terminal. And within these marks, here you can hear the voices of others. Not dead people, but the voices of other people all around us. Um, hey, what are you saying? Oh. Alright then. It's called the Whisper Hall for a reason, I guess. Give me a sign that this works and that this is not a complete waste of time or a trip. Yeah, you get that? <laughs> what you're looking at here is called a food Evo. And as you can hear, the sound is traveling to different points. Okay, we got it to work. Oh, it's working now. Oh, it's working? Yeah, what's working? Oh, well, it's working now. I was just like, Kevin, I cannot hear you. This voice is so like a bow. So as you can hear right now, the sound of our voices is being traveled all across the other room. I wonder what else we can hear across here. You think what I'm thinking? So some of the interesting facts here in the Whisper Hall is that apparently they say that there are hidden microphones all around these columns or maybe sometimes even in the center part of this entire part of the station. And that's why some people think that all this sound is able to be traveled from one place to another. Or other people believe because of the absence of space here, like if you were to turn around right now, you can see all of this open space right here and how it makes it available for different sounds to be traveled from there to here and over there. And even because the tiles and what they're made of could also allow sound to be traveled from one place to another. All right, so we're here with? Adrian Milton and Patrick Lehman. All right, so tell us about like more about this spot. Like, What were you telling us before? Well, these tiles are, are called Guastavino tiles, and they were invented in 1880 by Rafael Guastavino, who came from Spain. And the thing about them that is interesting is they're very thin. They're one inch thick, six inches long, and so they're not so heavy, so they don't come down, where the previous type of tile they used often would fall because of the heaviness of it, you know? And they have it also at the municipal building down by City Hall, the ceilings, and many subways have these ceilings, but often like public spaces where they want the sound to travel, you know, and th these, these are acoustic tiles. So like if it's a concert hall, they don't do it so much anymore, but they used to put these in concert halls so the sound would travel. And that's why this, takes the sound over. So it's like the composition of the tiles, right? How light they are. Yes. And also how this curves in and makes the sound travel from one place to the other on a certain angle. That's it's called a tumbral arch. And what a tumbral is, I don't know, but that's what they're called. And 
it's different than the Roman arch, which they used to use before. It's a it, it spans longer. You see, like it's lighter and it's and it spans further because it's because of the interlocking nature of it. Right, other position. Yeah. yeah. See how see how this goes like woo, where most of them are like this, you know. Oh, I see. So it's like how they're formed and how they're put together also allows for sound travel better, too. Right, yes. So they're very unusual. Of course, this building, you know, Park Avenue, when this building was first built, was not, it was just an open avenue. I mean, railroad tracks. The railroad tracks still are under Park Avenue. But the real estate developers said, what a waste of space. So they covered it over and then they built apartment houses on either side. And uh, this was built by Commodore Vanderbilt, who started out in Staten Island by bringing people into Manhattan on his little ferry boat. And he built it up and eventually he became a railroad tycoon. And, and Anderson Cooper is his great grandson. Uh, he's, his mother is Gloria Vanderbilt. So he, he comes from a very wealthy family. They still have a lot of money. Vanderbilt Avenue. <laughs> Oh, I see. So it's called Vanderbilt Avenue, named after the Vanderbilt. Who built this building. Oh, I see. And well, it was Commodore Vanderbilt. And he was the head of the New York Yacht Club. That's how he got that word Commodore in front of his name. And they were very rich. And they built lots of things in New York, you know. But this is their crowning glory. And they were going to build a building right on top of this years ago, on top of the whole station. But Jackie Kennedy stopped it because it's such a landmark and she said it should stand alone. And it does, and it's beautiful. And you've been upstairs in the Great Hall, right? Yeah, we've been there. Good. Well, well let, us know, let us know via email when you're on. We will. Thank you very much. It's been Thank very educational. You. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, you, you too. Too. Take care. This sphere is a reminder of the greatest loss in American history, September 11th. It is meant to represent peaceful trade and was inspired by the Kaaba at the mosque at Mecca. After the attack, it managed to survive with only a few bumps and bruises, a symbol of how we should be today.